Hi, everyone. Welcome to A Year of Reading Dangerously. This is our March discussion for the book Knocking on Heaven's Door. And we are so privileged tonight that author Katie Butler is here with us. And um, so, I mean, this, this is really good fortune for us that she's been able to take time out from her schedule to be part of this book discussion. And so I, in case you're, I know you're familiar with Katie from reading her book, but I just wanted to tell you a little bit more about her uh, from her bio in case in case you haven't read that actually first though I should give you a few instructions um, sorry <laughs> I'm out of order here but um, if you're calling in by telephone your phone line has been muted and when it's time to ask questions uh, you can press star two on the keypad of your phone in order to ask a question, but and that will let me know that you have a question, and I'll unmute your phone line so that you you can um, uh, talk with Katie and make a comment or ask your question. But uh, first, Katie and I'll have a little introductory discussion, and I'll tell you a little about her, and then I'll open it for questions. So thank you all for being on the line with us. Um, so, if you don't, don't know Katie's history, she is an award-winning journalist, a National Magazine Award finalist, and winner of the Science in Society Prize from the National Association of Science Writers. She has written about neuroscience, medicine, Buddhism, and human behavior for The New Yorker, The New York Times, Vogue, Mother Jones, The LA Times, Moore, and The Washington Post. And just an announcement for those of you who live in the Boulder area, Katie is going to be speaking at an event sponsored by the Conversation Project in Boulder on April 18th. And so if you live in that area or you'll be near Boulder um, in April, April 18th, you can go to the Conversation Project in Boulder.org. That's the name of the, that is the URL for the website. Um, to get information and register for that event with Katie. So I just wanted to let you know that. Um, so Katie, welcome and thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. I'm really privileged to be here and I just want to salute everybody in the book club for taking on a full year of these books about such a challenging subject. So I'm actually delighted to be here. So thank you, Karen. Oh, you're so welcome. And and I want to echo that. Um, I actually, I've said this before, when I got the idea to start this reading group, I thought, okay, if I can get 20 people to sign up, I will do this. And I really thought 20 was maybe the, a reasonable number of people who might sign up, but we actually have 900 people on the mailing list now who have signed up to read books about death and dying this year, which is amazing. So I'm yeah. really grateful that people are willing to take this journey. So um, one thing I wanted to say, Katie, as a doctor, I just wanted to really thank you for writing this book, because I think one of the things it does is explode a lot of myths that people have about the medical profession, about our medical system, and about what is possible at the end of life and you are such a truth teller and you've told a really difficult story but as a doctor who has long been alarmed by by how much our society is in love with the possibilities of medical treatment I, i'm just really grateful to you for exposing and bringing to light the issues that you brought up in knocking on heaven's door thank you so um I wanted to just, I have a few questions of my own I'm going to ask, and I see people are are entering their questions here, um, but I'm just going to ask a couple of things. And one I wanted to talk about is, um, is talk a little bit about caregivers and the journey of the caregiver. And it was clear to me from the book that your mom had a difficult time accepting help as a caregiver, and I think you admitted that you found it difficult as well. And in all of my practice in hospice, I've also seen that. I've seen exhausted caregivers who, when we came in with lots of possibilities of ways to give them help, said no. And I wanted to know if you have any other insights about why is it so hard for caregivers to accept help? Wow. Well, yes. I mean, my mother was the primary caregiver of my father after he had a stroke, and I was sort of the, you know, the boomerang um, 
daughter who flies in and out. And I saw what you're talking about in my mother. And my immediate thought was she'd spent an entire lifetime being a self-reliant and very hardworking person. And to switch gears for her and do things like go to a support group regularly or have people come in the house uh, that she paid to help or accept help from very, you know, colleagues of my dad's who really loved him and were, would have been willing to come once a week. Um, she just couldn't say yes to that. And when you were asking the question, I had another thought about it, which is that so many things get reversed when we're talking about end of life, you know, like morphine, fentanyl, bad if you're going to recover, but good if you're actually approaching dying you know mm -hmm. a lot of things sort of get turned upside down and these skill sets that were so useful in an earlier stage of life actually become detrimental you know um with my mother i think it's partly just exhaustion you get so exhausted that the only thing you can do is keep doing what you're already doing you have so few brain cells left for anything like adaptation or trying something new and with my mom, I I really had to get patient and wait until she hit the wall because it was only when she was really exhausted that she was willing to try something new, like have someone come in and put my dad to bed. And so I think if you're sort of one of these supportive secondary caregivers like me, um, it's hard to watch people suffer, but sometimes, you know, Sometimes people, I mean, just generally, not just about caregiving, people don't tend to change until the pain of not changing becomes worse than the pain of changing. And so, I mean, sort of one of my mottos is give give help, not advice. And so that's kind of a principle that applies here. Like I actually flew home and found somebody to put my dad to bed. And so simply having someone else take on a role like that can make, you know, kind of smooth the way to something like that. Hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, I was remembering when I, I, I just took care of my mom for a brief time, but at the very, in the last week of her life. And so it was kind of a 24 seven caregiver at home and not sleeping much but I and it's kind of what you describe I remember people saying what can I do to help and I could not think of a single thing yes. in the moment yeah. it's like I have I have no idea and I realized wow it would have really helped me if I had had a list of things somewhere yes. that I could just show to people like here's some things yes. bring me a meal I don't have time to cook anything and yes, because exactly. I'm taking care of her bring some food over you know if I Yes, and so, or text me when you're at this grocery store and ask if I can pick up at something. Or what a friend of my dad did is he just once a week took my dad out to lunch, and he didn't ask for my mother's permission to do that. He just made a plan and stuck with it and did it. I um, I agree with you. I think creating a list is a really good idea. There's also the notion of two-way compassion that as a caregiver you need to have compassion for the other for the person you're caring for and you also need to direct that same compassion to yourself so that could be you know a 4 hour break once a week with a hired caregiver if you have the money or just something that you can do for yourself my mother handled that by getting up an hour earlier than my dad so that she had an hour to do yoga and to meditate so she could actually get herself in shape for caregiving for the rest of the day. And she was actually quite direct with him. He was not to get up until she finished with her stuff, you know. Mm. So, yeah. That's very good. Well, it occurs to me that many of us on this call uh, will someday probably be caregivers ourselves. And I think it's a, it's so good for us to read this story and to envision ourselves in that role and be be prepared. How can I, what could I do to be proactive and how, how might I be ready and prepared when I'm in that situation to be able to ask for help because you'll do a better job of caregiving if you're not burned out and exhausted. So exactly. I, I think it's a good, really a good thing for us to 
to think about ahead of time and, and prepare for, including the men, because there are men on this phone call, and I mean, it, it's most often daughters, I guess, who care for their parents, but um, I think more yes, and more not men only, are, I think about a third are men. Yeah. Yeah, and more yeah. and more, I think, are stepping up. And it's up. important not to neglect them, you know? <laughs> exactly. Assume they're not there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, an another yeah. question I had for you is, what feedback have you heard from medical professionals about this book? I'm really I'm curious about that. Most of it's been extremely positive. Um, there was a cardiologist in Canada who bought copies of it for the entire incoming cardio cardiology fellows group trainees. Um, a lot of people saying some version of you've been you've been just what you said that that you that I as an outsider have been able to articulate things that they wish they could say or things that they have seen themselves and that have troubled them. Um, the one comment that I've got consistently it, about my own blind spot would be you don't realize how many families are just insistent that we do everything. There have been, you know, so doctors feeling like, yes, what you're saying may be true, but there's also another side of the coin, and that's the cultural side of it, which is people having unrealistic expectations of what medicine can do and not being willing to hear um, difficult truth. Mm. That, that's a very good point. But, but of that, course, my my immediate comment to that is, yeah, but we've got to get this process started earlier because denial is a natural human defense against difficult, you know, difficult situations. So it's not fair to have a family arrive at an ICU with a, let's say, a 90-year-old who is in their final crisis or someone with stage 4 cancer who has never had a single conversation with her oncologist about the fact that stage 4 cancer is ultimately a fatal illness. So I think it's also important to kind of mediate that conversation. It's we need to be starting to think about this five years before we think we're going to die or if we have some kind of incurable chronic illness that's eventually going to be life-limiting, that we need to start thinking and talking about this five years before we think we're going to die, not, you know, two weeks before at the, do at the door of the ICU. And I do uh, think, I do hold medicine responsible for that because I think... These conversations are incredibly difficult, and way too many of them are taking place way, way too late. It's just not fair to throw all of this in the hands of hospice or palliative care doctors and expect them to pick up all the pieces of the discussions that should have started a long time earlier. Because all of us have dealt with very difficult things in our lives, and we will deal with our own deaths and the deaths of people we love as well. But we need some time to kind of muster up our own resilience and our own resources in order to do that well. Oh, that's that's such a good point. And I agree with you. The burden of responsibility should be on medical providers who should be able to provide a realistic explanation of what yeah. is happening, what options are available, what might be expected in the future and and as you said it's not fair to place that burden just on palliative and hospice care particularly yeah. when pa patients don't get referred to those services until the the very end of life sometimes only a few days before they're dying um in the yeah and and i think given the fact that the system is unfortunate i mean i i've really come to think of it as morally adrift and w fragmented and broken and that doesn't mean I mean I have huge admiration for large numbers of doctors in all of the specialties but given that it is broken and that there really is no good pathway you know well well traveled pathway to a good end of life at the moment it really behooves everybody that's in your group to do exactly what they're doing, which is to read these books and to start contemplating the reality of death way before 
it actually is in our faces because we are going to need to do for ourselves what medicine is not doing for us at the moment. You know, I think, you know, I've written a second book which is uh, tentatively titled The Art of Dying Well, and it's much more sort of solution-oriented than this first book was. Um, But one of the things I really encourage people to do is to coax and coach their doctors to tell them the truth, to actually say things like, I'm the kind of person who needs information because I need to plan, and to actually say to them, I understand this is hard for you to give me bad news, but I really appreciate it, even though it's painful for me to hear. Um, Because I think doctors are afraid of causing us pain by giving us bad news. And it's sort of a role reversal they're, a lot of them are now trying are, are going through training programs to learn how to have these conversations more skillfully. But I think we also need to coach ourselves to open the door because both doctors and patients are both waiting for the other person to raise the subject. Uh- Exactly. And given that it's a two-way conversation, it helps if yes. both sides are preparing for how do we yeah. come together and talk about this. Well, that kind of leads into a question that was submitted in writing that um, I'll share with you, Katie, from uh, Sarah, who lives on the island of Cyprus, which was which okay. is amazing. And Sarah wanted to ask you about the idea of hope and whether you feel in your experience with your father that hope causes more suffering. And she went on to describe um, two of her relatives that died that were um, clinging to hope. And one was given, uh, it sounds like, false hope by a doctor and um, that she felt it increased their suffering and wondered what you feel about that. Yeah, I think it's a fascinating question and subject because clearly certain kinds of hope are destructive. You know, I'm a, I'm a Buddhist, and so, you know, the basis of Buddhism is that we're either hoping things are going to change or we're trying to cling to the way things used to be and we don't want them to change. And so that aspect of hope, which is, I I just know things could get better, I hope things are going to get better, can be a double-edged sword, especially as we approach the end of life, or things that we cannot change. And so what I think about is, in fact, one of the chapters of the book is called The Tyranny of Hope, and I know that when my mother made the decision to allow the pacemaker to go in for my dad, she she told me later when I asked her about it, she said, I still had hope at that point. I didn't realize that if you've had one stroke, you're likely to have another. So this unrealistic hope that my dad was going to continue to get better rather than to actually decline and get worse didn't serve her well at all in a decision make. you know, when she was in a decision-making capacity. So what I think, you know, and I've actually written a lot about this in the new book because I have a whole chapter that's mostly about cancer and terminal diagnosis, and I really talk about the need to redirect hope because we we do need hope, but we need hope that has a realistic chance of fulfillment. So you may not be able to hope to live long enough to see your daughter get married, but you could write her a note now that she can open on her wedding day. Or to give you a different example, uh, a friend of mine who's a cardiologist actually helped arrange a wedding in an ICU so that the mother could actually be present for the daughter's wedding. So I think it's a matter of kind of plan B hopes. There is the hope for a peaceful death. There is the hope for a comfortable death possibly at home, if that can be arranged. I think we need to think about, okay, we would all like to survive this illness or live longer, perhaps. But what are some other hopes? If that hope is not realistic, what are some other hopes that are, like family reconciliation, um, making up with that brother that you hasn't spoken to you, thanking people that you love for what they brought into your life? Um, I did a lot of that with my dad, um, writing him letters, Mm -hmm. expressing all my gratitude to him. And so those hopes 
were in fact realistic. Hoping that he was going to get better from the stroke would not have been. Uh, exactly. But having the opportunity, yeah, having the opportunity to express my love for him in a new way was was actually a wonderful thing. And so that's where it seems to me um, medical providers could be helpful in in helping outline what is reasonable hope for this patient at yeah. this time and what is unrealistic and to guide yeah. the family a little bit, the family and the patient toward here's where your hope can reside. This is a safe place for you to be hoping. Exactly. And here's where. And to, and to, yeah. And to unpack that whole notion of hope, you know, yes, I hope I could get better, but what's sort of lying underneath that? You know, what is my bucket list? What would give me a sense that my life had meaning? Um, to really open up that question in a in a deeper way, because I totally agree with your uh, writer in from Cyprus that doctors are extremely afraid of taking away hope from patients, and mm-hmm. as a result, they don't give bad news, so they don't really explain what stage four cancer means. And but people have a range of hopes, and I, I'm a great also student of the medieval tradition called Ars Moriendi, which meant the art of dying. And the hope was pretty clear there that, yes, dying was likely to be a spiritual and a physical ordeal for them in that time, but people also were expected to be resilient and to be able to behave with honor even on their own deathbeds. And I think we need to reintroduce that notion of we're not just passive patients as we die. I mean, we may, we will need the help of other people on on every level, but that doesn't make us without agency. That doesn't make us victims. We also have the ability to shape how we behave as people are helping us um, or as we're dealing with whatever we deal with, just as we have all through our lives. Mm. So well said. Um, uh, Let's see. I want to open it up if anyone on the phone line has a question. uh, You can press star 2 on your keypad to let me know you'd like to talk with Katie or ask a question. And while I'm waiting for those to come in, um, let's see if I can find one I can read here. Uh, Wendy typed in, did you ever consider creating a legacy project for your father? Yeah, I'm not, and I just really want to encourage people to 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 go ahead and press star two and ask a question. I'm, you can challenge me, you can ask me anything. I really am curious, and I think a lot of what's going on here is we're trying to co-create new conversations about death and dying, and co-create a common language that crosses between medical people and lay people. And I think we all need to find our voices and start telling our stories. And this is, it's a joint project of everybody. It's not just these individual authors that you're reading. I think um, we're doing this together. And so I'm really curious with any question that you have, even if you think it's too simple or too challenging or anything. Anyway, so the... um, Tell me again. Remind me again. Oh, uh, asking if you yes. had created a legacy project for your father. Yes. Yeah. Well, um, I'm not sure what the person meant by that, but I did, in fact, just a couple months ago, I dedicated a bench to my father on the campus where he was a professor. And mm-hmm. so we had a little ceremony, and we all had champagne around the bench, which has his name and my mother's name on it. And I actually did help get my father's final book published actually 10 years after he he had his stroke a, a colleague of his finished the book and so we had a again like a launch party at his university celebrating my dad and the guy who helped finish the book so mm, those were things wonderful. that I did yeah that's wonderful and yes that was really lovely and I also do a a Jewish ritual once a year called the Yartzeit candle, which is a year anniversary candle day of remembrance. And I go to Safeway and I buy 
from the kosher section, I buy a 24-hour candle. It's like a votary candle, and I light it, and I put his photograph on a little, like a little altar, like a little, um, you know, cabinet top, along with flowers and some photographs of him and his books. And I spend 24 hours a year just remembering him. I'm, I've become a huge fan of adopting and adapting rites of passage from any religion because I really think the more we can bring a sense of beauty and aesthetics and the sacred back into our experiences of sickness and old age and death itself, I think it's going to, I just think it's going to make it easier on all of us to kind of rehabilitate death if we can also bring some beauty back into it. Mm, absolutely. Um, well, we do, we have a caller, Wendy, at least right. Wendy is the name on your caller ID <laughs> from the Twin right. Cities, it looks like. So, Wendy, I've uh, I've unmuted your line if you'd like to talk to Katie. Lovely. Um, <clears throat> I have a question, Katie, about what your suggestion would be. I am an end-of-life doula. Um, caregiver who's in the process of getting certified in the next few months and I have a new client who is at a point where they're not sure how many months he has left and it could be weeks but he's definitely in an angry spot where he can't bring any peace to the idea of dying in a yeah in a comfortable yet peaceful, he can't quite admit that he's there yet. And his wife is also not quite able to speak those words to him. So I'm a little bit stuck in the middle and, and I know I can't fix it completely. I can only do so much, but I'm just, I'm trying to find the right words for him to be able to let go of his anger. Um, so he can spend these last weeks or a few months in a comfortable, loving way of, of looking back and seeing what he has right now with his children around him and his wife around him and not be so angry of this loss that he is about to um, yeah. to, to see. He's already, you know, he's, he's, he, he just broke down for the first time after I've been with him for five visits. Um, yeah. And so he's finally getting it. But I, I'm feeling that I, I'm just sort of at a loss for words. I'm, I'm new into the business and I'm, so anything you can yeah, say yeah. about that, I'm sorry if I talked this too yeah, long. Yeah, and I'm, you know, I wish I was more experienced, so I'm going to just lean on the people that I know who are, like Frank Ostaseski, who wrote a book called Five Invitations mm-hmm. that you might want to read mm-hmm. if you haven't. I have, um, yeah, I and have book. You have. But I just remember mm-hmm. Frank saying, you know, you got to start by meeting people where they are, you know, and if they're angry, mm-hmm. accepting that they're angry and he may die angry and you need to get comfortable with the fact that it's it's more in his hands than in yours and i would start there and i would ask what are you most angry about what are you going to miss the most about life mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. um and listen and um listen as much as you can for what are the fears behind the anger um Maybe to ask, what, are there things you're afraid about as, as well? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And some of those may be addressable very practically, you know, like, you know, I'm afraid it's going to be painful or I'm afraid it's going to go on too long or whatever it is. Um, but I, th- I think you, you, I would really suggest starting with getting going inside yourself and getting completely comfortable with the notion that he may die in a way that you think is not ideal. Mm-hmm. And get That's really helpful. comfortable. Yeah, just get really comfortable with how angry he is right now, how much he doesn't want to leave his life. You know, this is not what he mm-hmm. wanted. This is not what he hoped for. Mm-hmm. And to so mm-hmm. start with that position of really joining and you getting completely comfortable He's not comfortable with dying, and you're not comfortable with him not being comfortable. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Thank you. You know, so if you can start the chain in the right direction, you know, by getting really, really comfortable, and it's hard for you because you're just starting out, so you want to feel, you know, like you're you're doing you're being helpful. We all want to be helpful, 
Um, mm -hmm. But I think that, you know, sort of taking a step back into that fundamental state of letting go of results and letting go of outcome and being able to be there with him as he is right now. It's probably the mm -hmm. biggest gift you can give him. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have a call f we, from, it says Mark in Illinois. Your line is unmuted, Mark. Actually, it's not Mark, it's Felicia. My oh, husband hi, doesn't hi, to hold oh, okay. names on these names. That's the okay. different last names. And Comcast goes and it spins when they try to figure that out. <laughs> Katie, first hi, off, Felicia. I want to compliment Hi. I want to thank you for your book, and I want to compliment you on a couple of things. First off, you are a splendid writer. It was just a beautifully sung song for all of us to read. Second off, you're a damn good researcher, and <laughs> my, uh, you know, the statistics that you pointed out, my other hat, in addition to being a life cycle celebrant, is I'm an employee benefits uh, consultant. Uh -huh. So a lot of the healthcare and utilization stuff that you talked about is familiar to me basically from conversations with people on that side of the house. In other words, the insurance, the brokerage, that blah, blah, blah. Have you or would you consider testifying in front of either within your state or in D.C. about what the whole process is like. I think what happens, in my observation, uh, God bless Thomas Jefferson and his state's rights, but sometimes it makes me nuts because there's no uniformity among states, not only on right uh, right to um, exit, any of that stuff. But we, we keep reinventing the wheel each time. I think the data that you put out is so compelling a, we've got a thousand people turning 65 every day. B, we know what the cost of Alzheimer's is going to be projected. C, uh, my mother, like your dad, had vascular dementia, and that is a horrible road to hoe. And, <clears throat> excuse me, people are not computing at the the big level. I know we're talking about the individuals we're caring for, yeah. but I'm trying to look at the macro. A of what so is, can I just summarize here for a second? So I just want to make sure that everybody who's on the line is kind of on the same page with us, okay? What I hear you saying, and I just, and also I want to check out and make sure that essentially it's easy to get services that don't do you much good, like to get a thirty-five thousand dollar defibrillator, you know, six months before you die. But it's extremely difficult to get five hours of home health aid. With that could actually do you some real good, or palliative care services early in the game when they could really make a difference to your quality of life instead of just right at the last minute to unplug you. You know, is that what essentially, if I summarize it, is that is that what we're talking about? Right. I think there's a a yeah. really heavy heavy lack of understanding of how convoluted yeah. these systems have become. And because we yeah. do have more people entering in the aged group every day, um, we're talking about really material impact. And along with that, yeah. um, counseling and support of the family being reimbursable to the doctors who yes. deliver that care, that's yes. huge. I mean, with, with the Affordable Care yes. Act and, oh, the death meals, blah, blah, blah. No, you compensate them for your their time. And I you think know, the whole many, system is upside down. You know, because it, it pays for technology and it doesn't pay for time. And I would certainly be willing to testify if anybody had asked me. And I did, in fact, go and meet with Ralph Blumenthal, who is, I, I can't remember if he's, I think he's Oregon, who's very interested in these issues um, and sort of offered if they ever did have a hearing. I'm definitely. Um, I do think you. the systems are... There are people, I've, I've sort of been involved in the last year or so with kind of a think tank group of people from various dimensions of this issue, and there are definitely people within the big insurance companies that are trying to create these pilot programs to pay better for palliative care, pay better for supportive home care, 
rather, which keeps mm-hmm. people out of the hospital and then saves, in the long run, it saves the insurance companies money. Um, so I'm, I'm very encouraged that there are people out there developing and um, expanding these programs now, and it actually gives me a lot of hope because I don't think, I think individually we can do a better job for ourselves and our families by, let's say, reading these books and becoming informed. We can do a better job individually, but for it to really change on a system-wide, society-wide basis, I don't see it changing remarkably until the reimbursements change. Because as long as we are rewarding very expensive, suffering, amplifying end-of-life care, and starving, the palliative care people, the um, the oncologists who take a lot of time to really talk to a patient, as long as we are depriving the people who are trying to do the right thing and rewarding the people doing the wrong thing, I don't see it changing for society. I mean, anybody on this call has a, a very good chance of improving how they live even in decline even as disabilities mount, they have a huge chance of improving how they die or how their loved ones die. But on a social level, it's not going to be addressed until we um, start rewarding better good end-of-life care. Agreed. Everybody who goes through loss of a parent like you did, parents, reinvents it each time, which is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. In other words... It's all dependent on the resources available, where you live, what questions you ask, what questions you don't ask. And frequently, people don't even know what they don't know. So how do you know to ask for A if you don't know that A exists or is available or would be more optimal? But your your book was uh, was found in that regard. I think Uh, what we need to uh, send copies of Book far and wide. Oh. <laughs> we need to well, we need each buy yeah. ten copies and distribute them to people we know. <laughs> and I also want to encourage you, any of you, um, to also join the Slow Medicine group on Facebook, especially if you are a caregiver now or you you know coping or helping someone else, um, because people do get mutual support within that group and really high quality information also when they are faced with some of these quandaries because certainly in my family I was floored. My dad had a PhD. My mother had an MA. I'd been a reporter for 30 years. They had both signed durable powers of attorney for health care and um, you know, uh, advanced directives and we thought we had things covered and I think mm-hmm. what we did not realize is that there's active living and there's active dying and we're pretty clear on how to handle ourselves and our medicine when we're in either of those two phases. And what we didn't realize, and I realize now, is there's this gray zone in between active living and active dying. And that is a very nuanced um, experience of somewhat slow and attenuated decline for a lot of people. And and that's where the questions get much more complex because, well, am I living or am I dying? Well, in a way, I'm doing both at once. And so I'm still living. I still want to maximize my quality of life. I still want to maintain my function the best as I can. But I may no longer want a kind of health care that is directed toward simply prolonging life no matter what the cost and no matter what the quality. And when I say cost, I mean the emotional and practical cost, the caregiving cost. I don't just mean the financial cost to the system. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I think we're we're trying to develop a common language for this gray zone where we can really bring to the surface the questions and the goals that matter most to us in that phase. And they're actually a different set of, Um, assumptions and a different set of values than there are either when we're young and healthy or when we're, you know, three or four days from dying. They're they're different and we don't have much language for it. Good point. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Thank you, Felicia. Uh, 
I'll remind everyone again, you can press star two on the keypad if you have a question. And we have another question here from Mary from Tennessee. So I've unmuted your line, Mary. Hi, Mary. Hi there. This is Hi. I, I'm actually I'm actually Maureen. I go by my middle name. Oh, okay. And um I'm I, I just wanted to let Katie know that her book was so timely. I'm an aging life care professional. And I had a family that was debating the pacemaker battery replacement. Uh, and uh, it was so helpful as I just helped them ask good questions. And I didn't tell them what to do, but I was able to make sure that they understood all the things that they were looking at. And they right. they ended up not replacing the battery. They and uh, the their mom was 94, and dementia was part of the picture. Yeah. And quality of life had definitely been affected. Yeah. So. Um, so what were the what were the questions that you um, suggested that they ask themselves or their doctors? Well, who she was, and what should he, what would she have wanted at the time when she was actually decision making what were those yeah. ki those kind of conversations and they had had a lot of those so that was helpful and also right. they they were you know fear really motivates a lot of our decisions and they they wondered what it would look like so we asked the hospital very good group, yes what would this look like and i also contacted barbara karn and asked uh -huh. her if she had any first hand knowledge of what this would look like when the battery ran yeah. out. Yeah. And so Fantastic. all of that came together, and then the siblings got together. Fortunately, they were able to come together physically yes. to have the discussion and make the decision. Great. So and I, think I just wanted her to know that it did really <laughs> provide some good conversation starters for other families right. facing similar problems. I think that's just terrific, and thank you. Um, and I think that's one of the questions that we have that is so unspoken is, what's it going to look like? You know, like if I have congestive right. heart failure, or if I don't do the third round of chemo, or, you know, what is it? what does it look like to die of these different things? And, you know, there was a wonderful book like 20 years ago called How We Die, which did, in, he's a beautiful writer too, um, Shep Newland. Um, I also recommend that book, but um, I think that's one of the unspoken questions that we should start coughing up with our doctors if we do have. Oh yeah, doctors. am I still am I yeah. still audible? Yes, we yep. can hear you. There's there's another um, source now that might be the present day version of that book. And again, it's Barbara Carnes. She has a 24-minute video called "The New Rules for End of Life," where she oh, great. Dis discusses why an IV isn't helpful, and why yeah. you know why people who are in the process of dying they want to eat for us, but they're yeah. they're they don't need to eat, and how that normal process works. So we use that in our training for our caregivers, for our care managers, for some of our client families who are really grappling with this because it is scary and knowledge will help with that fear. And she has exactly. just a lot of great resources that we use a lot. Great. Great. Thank, Thank you, Maureen. You. Yeah, thanks. That's Thank really you. helpful. Um, I was going to add, I, I also think that a lot of specialty doctors may not have you know, may not have seen the deaths of their patients because if they do refer their patients on to hospice, they stop seeing those patients. And so there might be doctors who say, um, I don't know, I don't know how to yeah. describe what it will be like in yeah. your last days. So that's another knowledge gap. We really need to make sure all medical students get trained in hospice where they experience and witness yeah. deaths of patients with many conditions so that they at least have that uh, that understanding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, a friend of mine is a palliative care doctor, and she's talk she, she's 
just written a book which is not out yet, and the first chapter talks about how somebody asks her, well, who's dying of kidney failure, doesn't want to continue dialysis, and wants to know what it's going to be like to die. And she realizes she's she's completely through her medical training, and she has no idea what it's like. And I thought that was an eye opener for me. Yeah, yeah I I got a call once from a, a woman uh, obstetrician who was caring for her mother as her mother was dying, and had hospice coming into the home. But she called me and said. I've never seen someone die before. And she said, the hospice nurses don't, won't help teach me anything because they don't want to offend me. They assume because I'm a doctor, I must know everything. Oh. And she said, I don't know anything. I have no idea what to expect. So we sat on the phone and I gave her a crash course in death and dying. And then she said, I just realized how terrible this is. I'm a doctor and I don't know what dying looks like. And she said, this, this, this is wrong. So, so we definitely need big changes there. Um, let's see. So remember, okay, there's a call from a cell All right. phone in Toronto. So I'll unmute your line if you're from Toronto with the call. Yeah. Hello, it's Rebecca. Hi, Rebecca. Yes. No, I just really wanted to just um, – underline, underscore the train the the doctor's reactions and just the need for early education. Um you know from for for nurses as well. I'm a nurse. I'm also a psychiatric nurse. And you know, in all these conversations with the physicians, they are humans first, you yeah. know? And with that comes their human experience of dying, seeing yeah. people die, their relatives die. And I think it's really, it's not an excuse, but just to really, I always say to people, they're doctors, they're humans first, who don't want to deliver bad news, who have their own history that they bring to the conversation. So really to include that in the bigger picture as well, and definitely more education completely yeah. is uh, needed. But really, I just always tell people they're humans first, with just Thank like you. us. You know, that's Thank you. And it sort of brings me back to that, what I said in the beginning about two-way compassion. You know, we, yes. we need compassion for ourselves, and we also need compassion for them. And they're, they're untrained a lot. They're afraid. And then we've got the whole problem of the 15-minute um, office visit. So the way medicine has become so fragmented and so like an assembly line where many people do a tiny task and mm -hmm. then put the person mm -hmm. on the conveyor belt, the problem is it's hard to have a conversation like this with someone you've just met. Um, mm -hmm. In the You know, in the old days, people were often having these conversations with doctors they had known more, for more of a lifetime. And um, so there are so many structural things that make it difficult for these conversations to go well. And I really admire immensely the doctors who are getting trained, either they're already palliative care doctors or else they're branching out and they're getting some additional training to help them have these conversations. Because I think it's it's difficult on, on all sides. So thank you very much for the reminder. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, all right. Let's see right now. So remember, star two is what you press to join in. Um, but I had a, a question for you, Katie. In the years since you've written um, Knocking on Heaven's Door, and now you've written a second book, are you seeing changes happening in our society? I I do think we're seeing changes. I think we're seeing changes from both sides. On the one hand, we have the Death Cafe movement, and we have um, sort of celebrations. There's a group called Reimagine Death, which has met in San Francisco and also in New York. There's a conferences run by a company called IDEO, which is one of a sort of famous human-centered design company, tech, very high-tech tech group. 
um, that is running yearly conferences called Endwell. Uh, so on the cultural side, we're seeing, I think, a resurgence of interest, which I think will continue because of the demographics. I mean, baby boomers have always been somewhat self-aware, self-interested, I mean, in a good way. So I think we will continue to hear more and more articulation of this desire for a better way of death. And baby boomers were the questioners of authority, and I don't think it's going to end now. And then on the flip side, the fact that Atul Gawande's book was on the bestseller list for over a year. He has a group in Boston called the Ariadne Project, which um, I think is fairly easy for any clinician to join, where you can you can listen in and do webinars on how to have these conversations. Um, what we, I expressed before about insurance companies starting to change and to fund because to me, a huge missing link in here is home-based medicine. It's bringing back the physician house call and the nurse house call and realizing that when people enter this more fragile state of life that I'm calling the house of cards, which could last, you know, it could last three months and it could last ten years, all right? There's a point where you just want to keep people out of the ER because the ER becomes a gateway to a bad ICU death or a bad hospital death that doesn't have to happen there. We need um, we need something that we don't call hospice, but does take place at home and is available to people in their last two or three years of life. That c because I think that is a missing link to people being able to have more people being able to have good home deaths, and so. I do see insurance companies stepping in and starting to take on services that actually are provided in the home for people who are in this fragile, more fragile, chronic illness type of state. So I'm actually encouraged. On the other hand, I'm also a cynic and a big researcher, as you all know, who read the book. The forces arrayed against it are also huge because there's something like 3,000 lobbyists in the healthcare industry in Washington. And for a lot of them, the medical device makers, the makers of extremely expensive chemotherapies that may or may not do much good, all of those people, the makers of ICU equipment, I mean, all of these people have a vested interest in things not changing. And so I personally think it's going to take a grassroots movement which I think will be made up primarily of former family caregivers, you know, people like me, people who were daughters and saw their parents through the end of life but still have a lot of life energy before we have to start managing our own deaths. Um, I think it's going to take a grassroots movement similar to the movement that's happening right now with the kids around guns um, and that we will get our day in the limelight and there will be a point where the understanding of what's needed will be broad enough that we will sort of step outside our silos and our individual, you know, trying to manage our individual situations, and we will we will start to demand better end of life care. And that, to me, that doesn't just mean the last month. You know, it means the last three years. I mean, I would mm -hmm. like to see the hospice benefit tripled, the daily benefit tripled, so that the hospice benefit actually paid for home health aids, practical help to the family, and also tripled in length so that anyone within a year and a half of dying could qualify for hospice. And I think if we did that tri triple, triple thing, we would actually see an improvement in the number of people who actually have peaceful gentle, well-supported deaths in which the practical and the medical are well taken care of, which would leave people room to deal with what I think are just as important or more important issues, such as the emotional work of the end of life and the spiritual work of the end of life. You know, but it's very hard to do that work if you are in pain or you're not well supported or you can't be at home because there's not enough support for you there. 
So it's kind of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, but if you don't take care of the basics, you don't really have the mental and emotional space for the for the perhaps the more profound questions. Mhm. So true. Um, I love your thoughts. I love your thoughts about the triple triple solution and more home based care. And I yeah. just re- I recently interviewed a doctor who is uh, in San Diego who's doing home based end of life care, but for patients who are not yet on hospice. And he's helping yes. to advise them, helping them stay at home, find the resources they need, exactly. and then refers them to hospice when it's when it's time. Um, but we we need much more of that, and that is a model that could be replicated by doctors all over the country, especially doctors who who want out of kind of the rat race of medicine, who are ready to exactly move into a different a different time and place in their career, and want to practice differently. So, I find yes. that exciting. Yes, and and for those of you, the people who are who are listening in, who are some kind of care manager or health advocate or medical advocate. Uh, so many friends of mine have just talked about what a huge relief it is when they get a geriatrician who makes house calls um, to mm-hmm. help with their parent. And it's it's just like being on hospice, except it's not called hospice, you know, but all the advantages are very similar. Yeah. Uh, and again, yeah. And again, we need to advocate for it on a, on a, on a national or state level. Um, so, yeah. And um, Katie Marie uh, typed in, do you know which insurance companies are actually beginning to step up to support home-based care? Um, well, uh, Aetna, I believe, has done quite a bit and includes like a one-year hospice benefit. Blue Shield in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, a woman named Tori, uh, Tori Fields is doing amazing work there. Um God, I have a whole list from my other book, but unfortunately I don't have it in front of me. In many places, if you go to Aspire Health, Aspire is a independent sort of, uh, you know, nurses in the home um, service that a lot of other insurance companies kind of buy that as an add-on service. Um, that's really worth looking at. I think I think Geisinger um in i think in new jersey and pennsylvania um intermountain health in utah there i think if someone's already on medicare if you look for good hmos and medicare advantage plans a lot of those are moving in that direction because they have a actually a financial incentive to deliver that care better um it's i wish there were some central Agent, you know, some central place you could just type in your zip code and find out. But unfortunately, we're not there yet. Uh, the other thing, I w- there's also a group called um, GetPalliativeCare.org, which is the palliative care kind of public information line. And you can type in your zip code there and at least find out mostly it's academic programs in palliative care or in big hospital systems. But at least that's sort of a starting point. Um, to find this. We really need to kind of create a hybrid of palliative care and home-based medicine, you know. Mm-hmm. And in fact, I think the home-based part is almost more important than the palliative care philosophy. You know, there's a lot of overlap. Yeah, yeah, yeah so true. Wow, this this has well, been a great conversation. This an hour thank flew you. by, didn't it? Um, yes, w- and, and thank you to all the people on there who you know, I didn't hear from and can only sense out there. I just, um, I hope this was a beneficial hour for you and that you got value out of it and uh, really appreciate that you participated with me. It's lovely. And uh, I wanted to mention that I'm, Katie, when is your new book, The Art of Dying Well, um, potentially? Um, it's, coming out? it's due, it's pr- currently scheduled to come out in January 2019. So it is about nine months away. It's just been submitted. And it's another book for Scribner, which is part of Simon & Schuster. And if I may just put in the plug again for the Boulder um, Conversation Project, I will be there speaking at a 
at a temple in Boulder on the 18th. And if you go to, what is it, Conversation Project in Boulder.org? Yeah, yeah, it's the Conversation Project in Boulder. Quite a long URL to type in, the Conversation Project yeah. in Boulder.org. And you can find out um, more about that event. And so if you stick with our reading group here, I told Katie I will send out an announcement whenever her next book is available for purchase so that you guys can all jump on the bandwagon and get Katie's next book. And um, I wanted to mention also, Katie, you mentioned Frank Ostaseski's book, The Five Invitations. Yes. That book is on our reading list for this fall. Good. I think it's either October or November we'll be reading it. So, um, right. so good. We're, we're on the same wavelength. <laughs> and, um, and also your website, right? It's katiebutler.com. Uh, yes, it's katiebutler.com, and I um, I'm looking for speaking gigs. If you can invite, you know, if you can get some money together to get me to come, I'm I love speaking both at medical schools, doing grand rounds, and also community groups, um, so that we can just continue to build. Um, more skillful approaches to dying. And I come and I've got a video, not a video, I've got a PowerPoint with lots of photos of my family and I tell my family's story and and then really talk about this need for earlier conversations and address it from both sides. What are What are the things that patients feel really confused about when doctors put them in certain kinds of language and how can we coach ourselves to be more proactive and um, continue to shape our destinies in life and as we die as well. Mm. Well, that's just beautiful, Katie. I And I would want to sincerely thank you again for taking thank the you. time My out pleasure. to be with us. And I'm going to unmute all the phone lines of everyone on the phone just so that you can all say thank you. She can hear your voices all saying thank you to Katie. So everyone's unmuted now. Thank you, Katie. Thank, thank you very so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Great. Okay, yeah. that was sweet. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thanks everyone okay. for participating. Um and uh all right, I guess we'll say goodbye. I'll turn off the recording now and um say goodbye right. till our next discussion next month. So, bye-bye everyone. Great. Okay. <laughs>